refreshing opportunity to praise the Lord again together. Come on, help us out.
There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, man on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need, you've got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living way. Sweetness of the mercy seat now I've tasted it's not hard to see only you can satisfy what you're saying Oh there's honey in the rock mm, there's honey in the rock there's honey in the rock Spirit is body in the wilderness. You will always satisfy. Yeah, there's honey in the rock, water in the stone. Men are on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need, you got. It's honey. Bless him. God is faithful. So glad we serve a God who is consistent, that we can place our trust in who is the rock of our salvation, Jesus our Lord. Yeah. So there is joy in his presence. There's peace in his presence. And we're so glad that you're here with us today. I love it says, how sweet is the trust in Jesus. One of my favorite scriptures are, it comes from um, through the Psalm of Proverbs, that some trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of our Lord. And so this morning, we place our trust in Jesus. 
and we remind ourselves that he is faithful and he is worthy of our surrender. And maybe today you came in carrying some stuff that's a little too heavy for you that you can release at the feet of Jesus. We're going to enter into a moment together as we sing a classic hymn that says, I surrender all. And we have the opportunity to surrender ourselves before our Lord. So Lord, I ask you just to have your way in this place, God, that you would help us to surrender our cares, our concerns to you. I pray, God, for those of us who have not even surrendered our lives to you, Lord, would you just move in our hearts. Be glorified in this place in Jesus' name.
who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the star Now I am chosen Free and forgiven Future, and it's worth a living. Come on, if you believe that this morning, I was made tending a grave, I was called by born and raised back to life. But I was made for more. So why would I? Bed in my shame when a fountain of is running my way. I know I am. I was made for more. Come on, somebody needed to hear that this morning. Sing it out. I know who I am.
Good morning, church. Man, you guys sound good this morning. Well, at least from afar, anyway. Hey, we're so happy you guys decided to join us on a Sunday morning. My name is Tobin. I'm one of the pastors on the team. If we haven't met you yet, we'd love to be able to connect with you out in the lobby after the service. Our pastors are the ones wearing the white lanyard, so come up and say hi to us. We'd love to get to know you. If you're new to Skyline, we've got connection cards in the seat back in front of you. If you grab one of those and fill it out for us and drop it in the giving box on your way out and let us know you're here, we'd appreciate that. And we've also got that QR code on the seat back in front of you. That's kind of your access to all things Skyline. So thanks for joining us this morning. Hey, this Thursday coming up is Thanksgiving. Can you believe that already? It's Thanksgiving. We are not going to have our regular Thursday night service, so stay home and enjoy your family, and happy Thanksgiving to you. But we hope you'll come back next Sunday as we kick off our Christmas sermon series on December 1st, and we're also going to have a special presentation from our kids' choir, so you don't want to miss that. Well, in case you missed it last week, Pastor Jeremy and Janie made an important announcement, and for more information about that, you can check out Pastor Jeremy's blog at jeremymcgarrity.com. We want you to know as we head into the Christmas season and as we wrap up the 2024 school, school year, I say school, 2024 year, we are going to finish strong. We're going to continue to reach as many people as we can for Jesus. We're going to continue to light up the scoreboard in heaven, and we're going to finish this year strong. So we thank you for your prayer and your support as we do that. Well, today is the last day to bring in your boxes for Operation Christmas Child. If you took boxes home and you did not bring them back, we know who you are. <laughs> Just kidding. You still have time. We'll be collecting those until 3 o'clock today, so go ahead and run home and bring those back. If you did not get a chance to grab a box, you can participate online via our website, skylinechurch.org, or our app through our events page. So thank you so much for helping us touch the lives of children all around the world this Christmas season. Well, we're getting ready to jump back into uh, the fourth message of our sermon series, our off-road sermon series. So go ahead and grab your sermon notes. Uh, silence those cell phones. We've got a special treat for you this morning. Our, our speaker this morning comes from Bayside Church in Northern California. He's on the leadership team up there, and he's currently the campus pastor at their Orange County campus. And I got to tell you, he is one of the most gifted communicators you will ever hear. And we're so excited that he decided to, to join us this weekend. So would you please put your hands together and give a nice, warm skyline welcome for Pastor Andrew McCourt. Do you ever doubt your faith? I think you're always on a journey. You're trying to learn and grow and understand. And you're not always strong. You're not always in the right position. As we're all on a journey. Hey, Skyline Church, how you doing today? Uh, can we give a special welcome out to Lakeside, Tennessee, Arizona, Online Church, the International Space Station, wherever you're watching from. Come on, everyone, let's put our hands together. Thank you for joining us today. As I've said before, you need to listen very carefully, everybody, because this is an Irish accent, and this is how you will talk in heaven, all right? So I'm just getting you ready. This is just like a big rehearsal today. So good to be here. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm married to Isabel. Uh, we've been married now for, well, 30 years last year we celebrated. And that's pretty incredible, isn't it? I said to her, darling, you deserve a medal. And she said, a ring will do. A ring will do. I don't want a medal. I want a big old diamond. That's what I want. Uh, we've got four children. Uh, here's a picture of them with our daughter-in-law. This is Ben and Colleen over here. He's our oldest, and he's married to the wonderful Kalina. They live up in Sacramento, and then Dan's in New York. Uh, then Nathan over here, he is down at Cal Baptist. And then our daughter left us, everybody. Uh, she's serving in a great church in London called Holy Trinity Brompton. That's where she's at at the moment. And then we've got two in San Quentin, uh, because... <laughs> 
We're a real family, yes, everyone? Are the Simpsons here today? The Simpsons here? That's more like my family, all right? So we got all of them. And then Ben and Kalina, just three months ago, look, they made us grandparents. Yeah, that's the beautiful Killian. Uh, he was born 9.3, came out with a tattoo, a school bag, and he's already running middle school ministry. So he's, he's, he's doing good. We, we love him. What a privilege for me to join in today on your sermon series, Off-Road. And here's the question I want us to try and answer is, what do we do when God takes us off-road? We don't go off-road. It wasn't our choice. God takes us off-road, and it's really rough. I want to talk about this, a roadmap for suffering. When suffering comes into our lives and the journey doesn't feel good and we don't feel in control and we certainly don't feel like we got the wheel, we just feel like we're a passenger being thrown around without a seatbelt on. And I wanna try and help you today with a character in the Bible whose name is Joseph from the Old Testament and God took him off road. At 17, he had an incredible dream. We'll talk about that in a second. But it took about 13 years for some of the dream to come true when he became the prime minister of Egypt. And then in our story today in Genesis chapter 45, we join him at the age of 41. He's officially middle-aged, everybody. He's middle-aged. And he, at this point, is being reunited with his brothers. Now, they don't know that it's Joseph. Why? Because he's been in Egypt for so long. And he walks like an Egyptian. And he talks like an Egyptian. The jokes don't get better, everyone. That's it. And so, so uh, he re- he's at the point where he can hold himself no more and it's coming to the big reveal and this is where we're going to read. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet for the reading of God's word and it's from Genesis chapter 45. It says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly. Look at this. This is a middle-aged guy weeping loudly. And he's not even a Raiders fan. This is just like sheer emotion inside of him. That the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, really important, I am Joseph. And their jaws dropped to the ground. And then all the psychologists out there, you're going to love this. His first question to his brothers is, is my father still alive? Fathers are really important. But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God has sent me ahead of you. Father, today we just ask, Lord, that as we look at your word, which is truth today and truth in every generation, that you would open up our hearts, Lord, that we wouldn't be distracted by the thoughts of so many other things But Lord, that we would give you the fertile ground of our hearts. And we pray that your word would go into our lives and make us more like Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. So what can Joseph teach us today about going off-road with God into the really uncertain land of suffering? Well, I think Joseph teaches us three things. And the first one is this. If you've got notes, you can write it in. If not, you can make a paper airplane out of it. Whatever you want to do today. But here it is. He remembered who he was. He was Joseph. He turns around and he said, I am Joseph. Why was it important for him to remember who he was? This is the reason. Because from the age of 17... All the way through to 41, his identity had been under attack. 17 years old, he has a dream. He's just a young guy. 17, everyone. He's just learned how to drive, you know, because his parents are from San Diego. He got a Jeep Wrangler, you know, that's what he's got. He doesn't have a gun license or anything like that or any common sense, but he's 17. He's got a dream from God, a beautiful, beautiful dream from God, and he's a little bit silly everyone he starts to tell everybody about it and his brothers don't appreciate it because this is how the dream goes one day you're all going to bow down and worship me you don't tell your brothers that 
And so they weren't delighted about the fact. And then one day, his father, and Joseph was his favorite, his father said to him, go out to the field and check that your brothers are working. That's a bad idea too. You're the younger brother and you're going to check on your brothers and they didn't like him. And the Bible says that they saw him in the distance. How Does anyone know how they recognize him in the distance? Yeah, he had the coat of many colors. He had the bling on. He had the Armani. He was fit, everyone. And he was just like walking in the distance with his coat on. And they said, let's murder him. They're like really nice guys. (laughs) True brothers. Anyone got an older brother? Yes. Hope the therapy's going well. And so... So they look at him and they're just like, let's murder him. Let's kill him because they're jealous. And here's the truth, everyone. Not everybody is going to celebrate your dream in life. Actually, they're going to make it their primary purpose to turn your dream into a nightmare. Because they don't like what you're about. They're not all going to celebrate you. Here's the really cool thing. From the distance where he was at originally, by the time he got to them, they had downgraded murder to human trafficking. Really nice guys. And they human trafficked him. They got the coat. They hated what the coat represented. And they took it, they ripped it up, and they put it in the blood of an animal. Again, it's important for us to understand your identity is not in your stuff. Your identity is in Christ. And people can take your stuff and they can take everything away from you. But trust me, we got to find our identity in something deeper than just the things that we own. And this is the truth to everybody. We either worship with our stuff or we worship our stuff. Did you get that? You're either going to worship the stuff that you've got in life or you start to go, God, you've given me all of this stuff. I'm going to worship with it. Well, all the stuff, the identity on the outside of Joseph was taken away. And he was left, everyone, in his European Speedos. Are you glad the Bible doesn't have pictures? And he was sold as a slave. He was brought down to Egypt. And he's there in Egypt at a meat market. He's being sold as a slave in the European Speedos. And he's a fine specimen. He's quite like me. He's ripped. Why are you laughing, ma'am? I mean, this is not funny. And so he's standing there. And he's, he's just like, he's looking really good. But he doesn't have a name. In the age of pronouns, he doesn't even have a he. He's an it. That's all he is because he's a slave every, he's a slave. And Potiphar goes up, feels his calves, feels him. Then he goes, yeah, I'll take it. And Joseph goes under his breath. I'm not it. I'm Joseph, the son of Jacob, the grandson of Isaac, the great grandson of Abraham. He needed to remember who he was. And here's the truth, everybody, in life, is that some people, they're not gonna celebrate who you are. They're actually gonna attack who you are and you've gotta hold on to your identity. And when they call you whatever they call you and they troll you online, you gotta say, I am a child of the living God. I am chosen by Jesus Christ. When I was in my mother's womb, he called me, he appointed me, yes? We got to hold on to that type of stuff. And so he's taken down into Egypt, into the household of Potiphar. And this is what the Bible says. That actually, because Joseph was there, the household of Potiphar prospered everything in the field and everything in the house. Here's the good news as well, that you can lose your job. You can miss out on that promotion. You can miss out on that guy or girl that actually might be a blessing in the end. You can, have, you can actually move to a different place, but the blessing of God is not a place. The blessing of God is always a person and you are blessed and wherever you go, you're gonna bring the blessing of God. And no one can rob you of the blessing of God. They can take your position. They can't take your blessing. And so Joseph, he's just causing the blessing of God to come. So Potiphar, what does he do? He thinks, well, I I can just, everything's booming around here. I can travel a bit more. I can take like Southwest Egypt. I can fly a little bit more out of town. And so he did because Joseph was in charge of everything. Well, this is where the plot thickens. 
Joseph is in the house one day and he's got the Dyson out, everyone. He's got the Dyson. You all got a Dyson, all right? He's got the Dyson and he's vacuuming. He's a young, fit guy, okay? He, I'll not do this any longer in case I lead the sisters astray. And so he's just, he's just doing the vacuuming. He's just working away. And Potiphar's wife's there and she's a bit of a cougar. And she doesn't have anything to do. She's just eating grapes all day and lying back there on the Chardonnay. You know what I'm saying? The Chardonnay girls. And she's just like part of that. And she's just knocking it back, tanking it back. And she's a subtle girl. No, she's not a subtle girl. She doesn't even go in easy. She looks at him one day with the Dyson and she goes, come to bed with me. And let's be honest, everyone. This is a probably 18-year-old boy full of hormones at this moment in time. He's away from home without a cell phone. His dad doesn't have, find my Joseph. All you parents, stalkers out there, come on, you know who you are. Helicopter parents all day long, just flying over your kids. No one knows where he is. No one knows what he's up to. And here's another thing as well, everybody. Not only is he dead to his parents, he could easily go, I'm dead to God. And this is the way Christianity works in America today. God, you, you, you give me a dream, but you didn't come through. It was only a year ago you gave me a dream, but you haven't come through. And God, I'm disappointed. And then God, I'm really hurt. And I know people like this. They come to the altar, they fall on their knees, and they say, God, use me. And they're back six months later, and they're going, I feel used. <laughs> Hear me, everyone. This is God we're talking about. He's not James the butler waiting there for our beck and call. He's not a bellboy. He's not James the butler. He's Jesus the king. He's in charge of our lives. And even when things don't go the way that we think they should go, and even though we're taken off road, we got to go with Christ on the journey. And we got to keep our character. And a lot of us, we treat prayer like Amazon. We don't even come in and go, hey, king of kings and lord of lords. We just go, add the cart, add the cart, add the cart. And actually, we think it's Amazon Prime, and we expect delivery that night. Yes? And that's what happened. And this is what I find so much, and I speak of myself as well. I seem to be way more interested in the helpfulness of God than the holiness of God. I want God to do stuff for me instead of doing stuff in me. Are you with me? That's what prayer is really about. Not about getting my will done in heaven, but of getting will, God's will done on earth. And Joseph, he looks at her, and she said, come to bed with me, boy. I don't know, she's suddenly from Alabama there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch those Alabama women. Uh, and he says, under his breath, son of Jacob, the grandson of Isaac, the great grandson of Abraham. Well, one day she chased him down, proper cougar. She chased him down. And this is the whole closet thing with Jacob, or sorry, Joseph. Look at his life. His coat was ripped from him, and then his slave clothes, quite literally, she ripped the clothes off his back. I know there's no women like that in San Diego, but they all live in Egypt. No, they live everywhere and rip the clothes off his back. He's back to the Speedos, everyone. And then he's charged with attempted rape. Does anyone really want to follow Jesus? Does anyone want God's will for their lives? You see, a lot of us, anyone in here have great plans for God? No. God's got great plans for us, but some of them take us off road. So he ends up in prison, one day he hears that prisoner 47968, and he goes, no, I am Joseph. He's got to remember who he was. Two guys come to him one day, one morning, they said, hey, we both had a dream last night. You know what I would have said? Don't you dare talk to me about your dreams. My dream turned into this nightmare, and the reason I'm in this hellhole was because of my dream. Now I wake up, smell the coffee, and slop out. But what did he do? This is what he did. He said, hey, pull up two stools. Tell me about your dream. 
And you know what God does sometimes? He takes us off road from the dream that we had on this really clear highway. He takes us off road. He goes, I know a shortcut that you don't know. It's going to be bumpy. It's going to feel like a nightmare. But along the way, I'm going to test your heart to see if you can serve someone else's dream. While your life's in a nightmare, are you going to become immature, selfish, introspective, and make life all about you? Or are you still going to say, in my difficulties, I'm going to love and serve other people? You see the difference here, everyone? This is called maturity in the Christian walk. Maturity is not being a Christian. There are some people say to me, I'm a 20-year-old Christian. No, you're not. You're just like a one-year-old Christian 20 times. Is it okay if I preach? Or do you want me to do another joke? <laughs> we have got to mature in Christ. And it's the off-road that brings the maturity into our lives. And Christ, the Lord, was testing Joseph to see how he would serve somebody else's dream. So when we go off-road, how do we keep our bearings? Well, number one is we got to remember who we are. He remembered that he was Joseph, but also we got to remember who they were. They were human. The brothers, they were human. Yes, they were despicable. Yes, they were human traffickers. Yes, they were liars. Yes, they were cheats. But at the end of the day, they were just what? They were human. And I love this here. We'll read it again. Joseph says, and now do not be distressed. Just stop for a second. I would have said to them, be very distressed. Because see how that whole Egyptian army, they belong to me. And I'm going to tie you to two sets of chariots that are going to go in separate directions. But he says, do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. He is the one that's been through the distress. That's offering them comfort, comfort to his distressors. Why? Because he remembered that they were only human. Can I give you some advice today? It's simply this. Don't play the blame game. Nobody wins the blame game. The blame game. Don't do it. It's just nobody wins in life. And I don't mean to dismiss or downgrade anything that you've been through. Because some people sit in this room. You've been through stuff I've never been through. Most of us can't imagine what you've been through, the pain, the difficulty, the tragedy, the tears that you have cried, the tears right now in Tennessee, Lakeland, Arizona, wherever you are, you're crying right now in your life. Maybe even sitting in this auditorium or elsewhere, you're, you're, you're feeling it right now because you've been through it and you know what was done to you. How do you navigate that? How do you navigate what he went through? This is the truth, everyone. Don't let the outside get on the inside. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart. Because what? It is the wellspring of life. It's the wellspring of life. My father was 16 years old, and he left Northern Ireland to become a Royal Marine. And he served his country for nine years. And he was, he was a Marine, everybody. And he became the middleweight boxing champion of the Navy and was just a wild guy. He had fast hands, and he had a big mouth. And God did not come out of that mouth apart from a cuss word. But amazingly, a naval missionary came to his base, and on the third visit, he led my dad to Christ. He was gloriously saved, gloriously saved. And then with my mom, uh, they were married at that time, they headed back to Northern Ireland, and he thought, I'm going to have a quiet life after the Marines. I'm going to join law enforcement. But he didn't realize, 1969, 1970, that literally, my country, Northern Ireland, would blow up into almost like a civil war. Now, all you Gen Zers and millennials, you're going to have to Google this. But some of you Gen Xers and boomers, you're going to remember the news reports that came from Ireland in the 70s and 80s and into the early 90s. And because my father was law enforcement, he was seen as a legitimate target for terrorists. This is what Belfast used to look like in the 1970s. Just to get into Belfast, it was like TSA. Just to go to the mall was like this. Soldiers had come on the streets. I want you to remember this and these rifles. And people had to be checked. All their bags needed to be checked just to go to the shops, everybody. 
That's how crazy it was. Isabel and I, we planted a church in the city of Derry. Anyone here know U2, a band called U2? Anyone know that? They're going to be leading worship in heaven with the Skyline team, everyone. <laughs> well, they wrote a song called Sunday, Bloody Sunday. And it was about a tragedy that happened in the city where Isabel and I planted a church. One building that we used was bombed 23 times in 25 years. Well, it's 31st of December, 1976, and there's a knock at our front door. That's never a good thing at nighttime. Our curtains are always closed. Why? Because terrorists would come and shoot a police officer at their door. So my father always had the curtains closed at night. And then when he heard a knock at the door, he would stand, there's the front door. He would stand at the living room door at the side of the hall and would always take his 357 Magnum down at his holster, hold it here and say these words, who's there? That used to scare us so much as children. I want you to understand this. Front door is here. Go up the hallway. At the end of the hallway is my bedroom door. Open my bedroom door. The head of my bed is there. When my dad used to say, who's there? I used to sit up in case someone shot through the front door. The bullet would go up the hall and hit me in the head. There was no such thing as kids getting up and going just into the car to go to school in the morning. Dad would first go out while we stayed in the house. He would check under the car for bombs and then drive around the neighborhood in case there was a tilt switch. That was life. 31st of December, 1976, door goes. My dad says, who's there? And the neighbor answers. Dad opens the, uh, the curtains, opens the front door, and the neighbor says, Derek, I think, and boom, a bomb went off in our street. Aim to kill police officers. Here is the aftermath of that car bomb. Our windows were smashed. Crazy stuff. Neighbors have been going along and just saying, we think there's a bomb. And saying, you better get out. And a young couple down the street with their little 18-month-old baby called Graham, he was killed by shrapnel. The father was the first police officer on the scene. Seven months later, Cutting a long story short, he's a detective. He's out on duty, on Mark police car. Him and his partner ends up that they start chasing down bank robbers, terrorists that were out fundraising, and they just uh, uh, performed an armed robbery. They call for backup. The van that was in front went into a cul-de-sac. They had nowhere to go. The occupants got out, started to run away. My father, in ordinary clothes, brings, he jumps out of the car, raises his gun, shouts, halt or I'll fire. The backup comes, two police officers in the front. They recognize my dad. But remember I showed you the soldiers? There's two young soldiers in the back. They don't recognize my dad. They see an ordinary guy in ordinary clothes with a gun and they think he's a terrorist. From a distance of 13 feet, they shoot him with the most powerful rifle in the world at that time, an SLR, high velocity bullet, hits him in the chest, goes straight, straight through his body, almost severs his right arm from his body and leaves a hole the size of two fists in his body. And somehow he lived. And somehow he kept his right arm. And as my mother used to say, he's fine. He can still do the dishes. <laughs> That's Irish humor, everybody. My father, he told me this. He said, Andrew, I had colleagues die in my arms and too many officers died in his arms. And I had terrorists that died in my arms but I spoke Jesus over both of them. Last year, my dad turned 80. It was his big birthday. We all got together, everybody. And we didn't go there to meet an angry, bitter, toxic, ugly old man that everyone's scared of and the grandchildren are like throwing presents at a distance. <laughs> he is full of joy. He's full of Christ. Does he carry the scars? Let me tell you, he carries the scars. There's still not a night that he sleeps the whole way through. PTSD deals with every day of his life. But here's the truth, everyone. He wouldn't let the outside get on the inside. And there's a point in life where you and I, 
We go through this stuff and you've been through it. You've been through it. I know you've been through it. And I'm here to say, you have my sympathy. You have some degree of empathy. And I want you to know that God loves you and that he is for you and you have a story and God can use that story for his glory. Did you hear that? Your story for his glory. So how do we navigate this in life? Off-road, the road map to suffering. We've got to remember who we are. We belong to Christ. We've got to remember who people are. They're only human. And here's the last thing. Isn't it great when a preacher says the last thing? People thinking we're going to get home for the game. This is good. But he remembered who what? God is. He is what? He's sovereign, everybody. He's sovereign. What does that mean? It's just a big word is that he the man. He the man. He's in charge. He gets the last say. And I want to encourage you with this here. This is our God. One of his names is Alpha and Omega. What does that mean? The beginning and the end. At the same time, he's the beginning and he's the end. God is so cool that he actually finishes before he starts. Boom. That's how good our God is, everybody. He's so amazing. And this is what he says. Look at this to his brothers. But God, now I want you to see this, but God sent me ahead of you. That sounds like God got me a chauffeur-driven car and he just got me a ride, a fancy Uber. No, I mean, I was human trafficked. You guys mistreated me. You beat me. You ripped my clothes off. You, you made my father think that I was dead, but how does he turn it? How does he turn it around? But God sent me. This is what he was saying to his brothers. You're not my God. You're not in charge. You thought you were in charge, but I knew who was in charge the whole time. And even in my darkest moments, I remembered who I was. I remembered who you were. And I remembered who God is. And it's not about your boss. It's not about that husband that let you down. And it's not about some of the stuff that you've been through. As real as that is, I want you to try and see this, that God is bigger. He says, he sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. Joseph didn't know everything, but he knew there was something bigger going on. What was the bigger thing that was going on? Let me tell you this. The bigger thing that was going on, he just knew there was a sense of destiny in his life. There was Jacob and he had 12 sons and out of that would come the nation of Israel. And Joseph was just realizing, I needed to get you all down to Egypt because you're living in a famine. You gotta stay alive because one of the brothers is called Judah and out of Judah, a guy called Jesus is gonna come. And it'll be thousands of years later, but Jesus is gonna come. And what I had to go through it's worthwhile to get Jesus to come into the world. And this is, this is really important, everyone. He refused to make it about him and his pain and his suffering. And he just said, God, I don't know everything, but I just know there's a bigger story. And this is about you, God. And it's about the salvation of the world. It's so important that we get this, everyone. It's not about us. It's about the salvation of the world. I haven't said this in any other services, but, but listen to me. Here, Tennessee, Lakeside, Arizona. What, what is Christmas about? Christmas coming up. Well, it's about getting the kids back. And, no, it's not. It's about having a nice dinner and whatever and having the tree. No, it's not. You know what Christmas is about? It's about all the services that are going to happen here in all of the campuses. How many services are we having here? A lot. I can't see. There's just lots of fingers up. Tons and one million. I think that's what it was. Listen to me, everyone. You know what? You know what Christmas is about? It's about you and I not inviting our friends. It's about you and I bringing our friends to a Christmas service. And you got one million options. And if they say no to that one, well, you say, well, then come to the next one. Well, no, the kids are playing football. Well, you've got so many options. Just hunt them down. My friend once said this. If I had the power of God, I would change my circumstances. But if I had the wisdom of God, I wouldn't. If I had the power of God, now this is, you gotta hear this, everybody. I'm a pastor, I'm also a Christian, by the way. 
but if I had the power of God, I'd be dangerous. Because there's some people right now, I would zap. I would just zap them. I've got a hit list. Anyone else with me? I got a hit list. I know who's one number one. <laughs> no. I got a hit list. I would zap them. Actually, I wouldn't zap them. I would slow roast them. <laughs> Zapping's way too quick. But the power of God to be dangerous. I would change my circumstances. But if I had what? The this is our word for the year, Skyline. Wisdom. If I had the wisdom of God, I wouldn't. I would just go, there's something, this hurts, but there's something bigger going on. So I have a friend, his name's Danny Guglamucci. If you say it three times, you're speaking in tongues. It's an incredible name. And his son, Chris, was running a youth camp. He's a youth pastor in Australia, and he's got all his kids there. They're outside playing. He walks outside, and he sees the storm clouds coming, and he just thinks, ah, I don't like the look of that. Get the kids. Come on, everybody. Come on in. And so they're all coming in, and he gets struck dead by lightning. Instant. Boom. Gone. Someone serving God, good married man, father of four kids. Gone. I remember hearing the news and trying to text Danny. I, what do you say, everybody? Have you ever like written a text 50 times and every single time it just sucks? You just look at it and go, bro, ah. Danny had to take his own son's funeral. Stuff we shouldn't have to do. And later when he got home, he tweeted these words. As our beautiful son, Chris, has left us for heaven and find practice in what I've preached. Trust sovereignty when there is no clarity. And I wish I, I, I wish I had some spiritual gift today where I would go, you know what, if you don't have clarity, I want you to form a line and I, I, I'll give it to you. I've just got like a hotline to heaven and I've got, you know, I've got a clarity word for every person and, and you're going to walk out of here going, oh, I, now I understand. No. The only thing I got for you, everyone, is sovereignty. And I don't mean to sound trite. All I'm going to say to you is, bad stuff is happening, but he's still a good God. It's a rough road, but he's still got a big plan. Hang on. Don't let go. And this is one thing that I know, everybody. That our God, he works the night shift. He's not just the God of the daytime and the good times. He's the God of the nighttime and the dark times. Our God works the night shift. And he is with you and he's for you. And you know what else? Crawling counts in the kingdom of God. You used to be up fast, chest out, running. But now you're crawling. But it's still Yeah, you're off-road, but you're not alone. God somehow still got the wheel. Just remember who you are. Remember who they are, and remember who he is. Amen? Remember who he is. I want you to do this. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Would you do that for me? And don't check your phone. And don't leave the service. We have tasers at every door. You think I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> it is a joke. But if you would just bow your head, close your eyes, stay with me for a second. If you're here today or at one of our campuses and you're going, I want to follow this Jesus. I, I want this God in my life. I need him in my life. We have an ABC here. It's really simple. It's about admitting we're a sinner. It's about believing that his death is everything for us choosing to follow him for the rest of our life. And if that's you, and you would like to become a Christian today and start that relationship with Jesus, would you simply pray this prayer with me? I'll say the words and you can repeat them. You can say that with an Irish accent, whatever you want. But here we go. This is so important. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I confess my sins, and I repent of those. 
and I turn to you because I believe that your death paid the price for sin. And today I choose to give you my sin and receive your forgiveness. To give you my past so that you can give me your future. And Jesus, take the steering wheel while I get into the trunk and be my Lord forever. Everybody, can we celebrate everyone that prayed that prayer today? Can we put our hands together and just celebrate them? And if you prayed that prayer here or one of the campuses, just scan the QR code. And this doesn't send you to heaven, but what it does, we get to send you something about your next steps and how you can follow up. And then can we do this? Can we just say thank you to our campuses for joining us today? So good. Hand back to the campuses. And for everyone that's here, I just want to say blessings to you. Thank you so much. You're an incredible church. This is an incredible church with a remarkable pastor leadership team. I want to speak the blessing of God over your life today as you leave here. Hey, I'll see you out in the lobby. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs>